Good morning again, everyone, and it's uh, awesome to be up here to share God's word with you this morning. Um, for a few weeks now, uh, God has put upon my heart the um, the word apostasy. Um, there is a real um, apostasy that's sweeping through the churches, that is sweeping through the nations, and I believe God um, is is giving us a wake up call to rise up. You know, it's um, enough of us sitting down and and coming to church and feeling good about church. Um, And today I want to start off, and every time I come up, I bring a message on the book of Jude. I believe that the book of Jude is a book that is not touched upon a lot in the churches, but is a very powerful book. And and it's a book for these days, for, for these days. And I want to start this series today by giving you an introduction into the book of Jude so you'll be able to prepare yourself. There's only 25 verses in that book, just 25 verses. I'd like you to go home today and in your quiet time, read, read the 25 verses and ask the Lord before you start, what is it that I need to do, God? What is it that I need to do? And it's, and it's, um, it's one of the smallest books and yet... Um, we're going to only look at the first four verses this morning. We're going, it's, uh, I, some people say that the book of Jude is also the book or the letter that Jude did not want to write, but he actually ended up writing that book. Um, and, and it represents the word apostasy in a way that is misrepresented today amongst the churches and amongst believers. And I want to take you back to two readings in particular, Acts chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 28. Paul had called the elders and he gathered them together to warn them that something was about to happen in the future. And Paul says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. And this is what Paul's saying. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Be aware, church, this is written to us. Therefore watch and remember That by the space of three years, this is Paul speaking, he says, For three years I cease not to warn you, warn every one of you, he says. For three years I kept warning you. And how did he warn them? Night and day with tears that this was going to come to pass. Now come to Jude chapter 1, sorry, Jude 1 to 4. There's no chapters there, just just Jude. And God's word says... Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified. Here the word sanctified literally means the beloved, translated. By God the Father and preserved or kept in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He says you've got to fight for your faith which was once delivered to you. For there are certain men, now look at the comparison with Acts 20, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we go through every time I come up, I'll take a little snapshot of Jude and we'll work through the 25 verses. But there are some characteristics I want to bring to you this morning. And before that, let's bow our heads and just commit this message to the Lord this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, 
this is your church and we are your people. Father, your word offers protection for those who believe on you. And today we bow before you to seek that protection. We seek your hand upon this church that every false doctrine, that every falsehood will not come near our territory and that we will be strong in your word, not relying on, our, on, on another person for your word, but relying on your word ourselves. So that in the time of need, we will know what your word says. And we will fight knowing what your word says. Father, I thank you that in you we are not weak, but we are strong. We do not run and hide from the onslaught of the enemy, but we stand with boldness and speak with the authority that you have given us. And Father, this morning, I pray that a spirit of discernment will be placed upon this church, upon every man and woman, upon every boy and girl, to know what your word says and what it does not say that you and you alone will be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So there are some characteristics I want to look at this morning. This is probably one of the most unpopular letters in the New Testament. And what is this letter about? And if I could sum up this, these 25 verses, there's one word that I can bring up. And it's beware, beware church, that something is about to come through and you need to be alert. The Apostle Jude wants the people to know that Satan, Lucifer, the prince of darkness, the angel of light, he's real. He's alive and he's well. But he also wants you to know that you have authority in Christ to deal with that situation. And that's why this little book is often neglected and in some cases even hated because it speaks the truth. Why? Because it calls Christians to arms. And when I say that, I don't mean you're taking your swords, putting on your, you know, your physical swords and your helmets and jumping up and down the streets. I don't mean that. What I mean is being spiritually ready at all times to fight your battle. The language in this book is strong. Sometimes it's harsh. It's even rebuking and, and scolding in some cases, severe. But Jude says it like it is. He doesn't beat about the bush. Because you know why? We as believers sometimes like the easy way out. We live in an age today where the gospel is sugar-coated so that you feel good when you leave, but you're not equipped and you're not armed with the word of God. You love, or churches love, or people love a great sugar-coated gospel. But Jude is telling us today that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against what? Principalities and powers of darkness. That's where our battle is. And the church is the only body or the only organism who can fight in the spiritual realm for that particular situation. Do you believe that? That the church, that is you and me, are, are the only People are the only body that can fight in the spiritual realm against the enemy. And Jude's message right in the 25 verses is, get up, get tough, and get to war. So why is Jude holding such a strong and severe rousing language in his, in his 25 verses? It's simply because Jude is dealing with the, with the issues of life and death. 
He speaks of a dishonoring attitude that we have towards Christ. And then he talks about a deception that will come in to deceive souls that it's okay to do certain things when it isn't. And Jude is expressing a sentiment here that we see in Ephesians 5.14 where Paul's saying, come on, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, let Christ's light shine through you. Every one of you have to have Christ's light shining through you. Amen? I didn't hear that. All of you are carrying the beacon for Jesus. Amen? All of you are. And Jude is crying out today to us as a church in the last age. Wake up church. It's time to get your arms right. It's time to get back to basics because the battle is on. And it's real. And that's why Paul in Galatians 3 verse 1 says, "Who, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you to believing all these wrong doctrines and things that are coming through the church? In other words, he's saying, I'm your spiritual father. And when I look at the things that you indulge in and do and hear and run to, you know, I feel, I feel pain for you and for your soul. And so he says, it's almost like a spell has been cast upon you. That's what Paul says. He says, how foolish can you be? And he's talking from a spiritual sense as a father to the people. So within the church of Jesus Christ, we see two issues, church. The first one, that there is a serious lack of theology within the church. And there's a serious lack of exegetical, which means that verse by verse explanation of who God is. And unless the church is taught who God is, unless you know that your word line by line says this is what God says and this is who he says he is, you'll not be ready to fight your battle. But that responsibility also rests on you and me to read every single verse and say what it means, Lord. Tell me what it means. The second problem of the church is the church has forgotten how to save souls. And I'm being harsh today, but I'm looking at Jude and going, Lord, where is my spirituality in all this? The church feels comfortable in sitting within four walls. The church has to be out there saving souls. The church has, there are organizations that have taken on that role, and we don't mind donating to help somebody out when that perhaps that person really needs the gospel. Yesterday I was had the privilege of speaking at Pastor Bob Chapman's memorial service. If those of you know Pastor Bob Chapman, he passed away and we were not able to have um, a, a proper service. So it was amazing when I, I mean, his life was played out and, and, you know, we were just gathered there as a body of Christ looking at the, as his journey. Do you know he was even uh, rejected from his own people a, a couple of times? He traveled all through Western Australia, planting churches on all he wanted to do. Even in the end, when it came to, do you want chemotherapy? He refused. And he said, my journey is now done. I'm now ready to go home to be with the Lord. To see his students there, to see pastors there was just so amazing. You know, it, was, uh, just, it just made me realize, what is church about? What is church about for us? There is in the church, I guess, a lack of general vigilance at the rise and at the spread of apostasy. Why? Because we live in a tolerant age church. We live in an age where harsh words, oops, you shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have done that, is not, is not tolerated. Apostasy is a word that's been misused and, misused and misrepresented more than ever. And when I look at Acts 20, 28 and 31, in 28, Paul gives us a blueprint as he exhorts the leader. He says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Every ministry leader here today, pastors here today, myself included, we've got to watch over our flock. And we've got to lead by example. Because if your example is causing somebody to stumble, you're going to come before God and repent. Amen? And in verse 31, it says, therefore, watch. Watch, because you see the church has gone to sleep. And, 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 and Paul's saying here, therefore, watch. And remember 
that for three years, three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This was a serious matter for Paul. That they were going to come wolves into the church to, to, kill the, to kill what God's people had by way of faith. And he was trying to impress upon the people the need for God. The need for the righteousness of God. For his word to be yes and amen. That you will know that when there is a snake amongst you. That you will know that when someone comes with lies. You will know what God's word says and you can defend it. Amen. Church, are we warning people with our tears night and day? When you see something that is not wrong, are you bold enough to go up to that person and say, brother, sister, much like Jude, much like Paul, Paul didn't slam them, yeah, he called them foolish, yep. Yeah. But he says, I cried tears night and day for you for three years, warning you of this. I'm not saying be rude, I'm saying be alert. And be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is asking you to speak. Let's look at Jude's letter. Jude chapter, uh, Jude verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, and to them that are sanctified or beloved by the God the Father and preserved that's kept in Christ Jesus and called. The first thing that we know about Jude here is that he's a servant. He says he's a servant. He says he's a, he's a sibling and a, or, a, and a brother. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. Do you know in, Mark's, in Mark 6 verse 3, you see James was a half-brother of Jesus. So if James was a half-brother of Jesus and Jude was his brother, he's also the half-brother of Jesus. Amen? John 7 verse 5, you find it says that no one, Jesus says, no one believed him, including his brethren, which means Jude too didn't believe him at that time. Acts 1 14 in the upper room, we see all the disciples, including Jude, then waiting for the Holy Spirit to come after their conversion. 1 Corinthians 9 5, they're called the brethren of the Lord. They are now in with Jesus. But you know what is amazing that that we can call each other brother and sister because our Lord Jesus Christ deems us as brothers and sisters. He says that to us. Jesus said, these are my brothers and my sisters, my mother and my father. He says that. And that's why you and I can boldly say that, you know, that song as the deer pants for the water, you are my friend, you are my brother. And sure, you're a king too. How amazing is God? Isn't it wonderful to know that the blood of Jesus Christ is greater than any blood bond between two people. Do you hear what I said? The blood of Jesus Christ is better than any blood bond between two people. Therefore, you are my brother. Therefore, you are my sister and my mother and my father. And then Jude goes on to say he's a servant of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's not a reverend Jude, not Pastor Jude. Not Jude with PhDs or Professor Jude. I'm just a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no pomp. There's no ceremony. There's nothing special. He, and you know what he doesn't say? He doesn't say, I'm the brother of Jesus. Did you notice that? He doesn't say that either. He says, I'm the brother of James. But what would we do? If you were the brother of a king or a prince, oh, I've got to put a name and I'll drop a name in right now. I, I know Scott Morrison or whoever. You see, he didn't look at Jesus primarily as his half-brother. He looked at him like his Lord. And there's a precious truth being the half-brother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, didn't save him. Did you know that? Though he was Jesus' half-brother, just being his half-brother didn't save him. Church, just because your parents are pastors, maybe you were born into a Christian family. Yes, maybe you went to church all your life. But if you are not born again, you are not saved. It's a personal relationship with the Lord. Amen? You, he had to have, that's why he says he had a personal experience. As you read through the verses, he had a personal experience of who God was in his life. If you think today that you have a family history, think again. What it is, is it's about you and Jesus. Jude also goes on to tell the first century Christians that 
he that there are three things. Everything that you see in Jude is done in threes, and we'll talk about that as we go through. The first three things is that you are called, you are loved, and you are kept. Say to someone, you are called, you are loved, and you are kept. You know why you are called? Because you may be going through life's journeys and you're walking in your trespasses, you're walking in your sins, and God's Holy Spirit comes and, and, and makes you really unhappy in your sin that you hit rock bottom. And when, when God's Spirit comes upon you and you really hit rock bottom, there is nothing else but to go up. And the Holy Spirit convicts you of where you are. And he brings in a measure of, of redemption and, and therefore salvation. And he enables you by faith to cry on the name of the Lord and you are saved. Amen? So you are called. Isn't that what the church is? To bring brought out of. Ecclesia. Bring brought out of. You are called out of this world. You are called out of so many things that you may think that you're involved in. You are loved. You are the beloved of Jesus Christ. You are not called because you look well or because you talk well or because you think that you're a Christian. No. You are called because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. And you're the loved of God because that's why it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son for us, for you and for me. You see, this book is enough for all. We are called, we are loved. And now this is the seal, church. This is the seal that you're preserved. Tell someone, I'm preserved. I'm kept. I'm preserved in Christ Jesus. I'm preserved. Can you declare it? Don't be ashamed to declare it. I'm preserved in Christ Jesus. Be bold to declare it. Because if you are bound by anything today, that will break when you declare that you are preserved in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? That you are sealed. Amen? You are sealed by in Christ Jesus. He hasn't brought us, bought us with his blood to leave us or forsake us, church. If you're, if you're of God, you're called, you're loved, you're kept because he wants to save you. He does not want to see you perish. And now we come to verse 2, the request. He prays to God that you as believers should know three things. Three things you should know as believers. The mercy of God, the peace of God, and the love of God. Amen? What was the first three? No, the first three? Called, loved, and kept or preserved. But now he says, why? Because he wants you to experience what? The love, the mercy, and the peace of God. That's why Jude is writing this, this letter. He's saying to you today, there's a lot more coming in these scriptures. But I'm going to tell you up front that you are called, you are loved, and you are preserved. You are sealed. But the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to experience the love, the mercy, and, and, and the peace of God in your heart. Amen? If that's you today, say, Lord, I receive this. When you declare that, you've declared your right to receive it by the blood of Jesus. Amen? When you said that, you said, Lord, I receive my right to receive this right now in Jesus' name. Amen? You know, church, the reason for the letter is given in verse 3. And it says in verse 3 in Jude, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He says, I wanted to tell you about the common salvation that we have. I don't know where Jude actually wrote this letter from, but wherever he wrote it from, he was just going to say, Dear church, Jesus saved you. Be happy, etc. But then he goes on to say, I wanted to write about your common salvation. And if I can put a little word, but, in there, he says later, it was needful. Say the word, it was needful. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly, what? Contend for the faith. Turn to someone and say, contend for the faith. Jude Church had a love that was willing to warn God's people. Do you have a love to warn those who are unsaved? 
Are we ashamed to speak about Jesus? You see, he's saying it was, it was needful. It was, I was compelled. I had to write this. I, there was a necessity for me to bring this to you. I had to write this. I had to, I was going to write this, but I had to write something totally different. And I want to say to every pastor, myself, Sunday school teachers, ministry leaders, we need people that are conscious that God is speaking to us so that when God, when we want to do something, God says, nah, and you obey what God wants you to do. Not what man says that you ought to do. God is so active that he's willing to change your life and my life at any point in time. And God, and we must be so willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's why he's been given us. The Holy Spirit is an enabler. Amen? He enables you. Say to yourself, the Holy Spirit enables me. It's a declaration book, church. I'm calling you to war today. I'm calling you to spiritual war today. I'm asking you to put aside your weakness, your, your timidity, and to really stand up for who Jesus is in your life. The Holy Spirit will equip you and will enable you. So what is the underlying message? He says, I got necessity to write unto you and exhort you, this is in verse 3, that you should earnestly contend you know what earnestly contend means? Vigorously defend. Passionately defend. Yesterday I had to speak on behold he cometh. You know that was the message topic that was given to me. And I stood there and I, I, I actually asked the Lord before I went to this meeting because I didn't realize I was going till about three, four days before when I got the flyer. And then I went into panic. Go, what am I going to speak on? And then I saw the topic. I had a topic to speak on. And the, the word was, behold, he cometh. And I spoke on the ten virgins. Everyone had the same clothes. They all went out to meet the bridegroom. They had the same equipment. Every church has the same things. They have the same word of God as well. But they had no power. They had no oil. They had no light. And I'm coming back here. I said to the church yesterday, are you ready that when the midnight cry comes, when the midnight cry comes and the trumpet is sounded to rise up and know that God has come for you. Are you ready? Are you ready, church? You can't say, God, just give me two more days and I'll make things right. He will come and he'll come unexpectedly. That's what God's word says. And Jude is saying, contend for the faith. In other words, he's saying, fight for your faith. How many times we walk over, we let people walk over because we are too scared to defend who Jesus is. Today I want to say to you, you can defend who Jesus is. You can go as a martyr, Stephen, when he saw the Holy Spirit, you know, when he was going to die, he, he witnessed, I'm sure, the Holy Spirit come upon him. And he wasn't afraid of his life. So what are you contending, contending for? You're contending for your faith. The substance of things that you cannot see, but you know exists because God's word says it exists. Amen? Faith is a truth of what God has revealed to you. And church, as believers, God has revealed his word to every one of you as believers. You cannot say, I do not know who Jesus is or what he did for me. Are you with me, church? And the, it says the faith once delivered to the saints. In Jude verse 3 it says, you have to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. You know what once delivered to the saints literally means? It says once and for all delivered. In other words, you cannot even add a word to it. You cannot take it away because what was done has been done and sealed. That is the word on which you stand. Amen? Theology may evolve, church, because, you know, man's understanding comes up. It grows. Theology may, may evolve, but the word of God never changes. It is sealed in its contents. It is sealed in its authorship, and it is sealed in its historical setting. No man can take from it. No man can add to it. And you know when you'll know that something's wrong? is when you actually open this book and start to learn and meditate on God's word. Church, 
God wants a church that is so immersed in his will. And if you want to know God's will, this is where you go. A pastor can help you. A pastor can pray for you. You can go to a counselor. You can go to whoever you want. But if you want to know God's will for your job, for the man that you're waiting for, you don't need to go chasing for somebody else. If you want to know God's will, because your friends have left you, because you're a churchy person, because you're weird and you speak, you're weird and you speak in tongues, no matter what it might mean, go back to God's will. What does God say and what does he say who you are? Amen? This is your best book. This is your best guide. You see, there is a spirit of tolerance that Jude says has come into the church. You see, it's easy to be tolerant of some behaviors. It's easy to say, it was just a little bit of drink. What's, what's wrong with that? It's easy to say, it was just a small white lie. Come on, you know, cheer up. Or go to Barnings, get some wood, build a bridge, get over it. It's easy. It's easy because you know what happens when there's a spirit of tolerance that comes in? It becomes established. What you have done becomes established. And once something becomes established, that's when a fall starts to happen where God is concerned. And this morning, church, if you tolerate wrong, it will become established in you and your family and will become a curse to the generations to come. It's because someone did not say, no, I'm not doing it. I want to challenge every single person this morning today. Can you say no to something this morning that you have been doing? And say, no, I refuse today to even entertain that thought. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I, ref I, ex I refuse to entertain that. I'm, I'm not going to allow it near me. Can you do that today, church? Can you do that today? Do you know what John Wesley said? God, make me a man of this book. In other words, God, make me a woman of this book. We should be saying that every single day. Jude, verse 4. Jude is speaking about those who are in the church and claiming he's, these people now, remember church, this is being spoken to us in these times. So Jude is warning us about people in the church claiming to be, be, claiming to be Christ's children, claiming to know Jesus. Jude is talking about false brethren and he says they are apostates. They are the tares among the wheat. They are the weeds that need to be plucked out and pulled out. They've infiltrated the church with their doctrine, with their worldly thoughts. And they, and, they, and they are not, they, and they're so different from Christian and holy thinking. But they claim that they know Jesus. But you know what? They are so synthetic that they try to destroy God's people and destroy. They come up with a gospel garb that's only skin deep, superficial in every way. Believers, I want to say to you this morning you and I are in a battle. Amen? Let's acknowledge that you and I are in a battle. Yes? And what, you know what Jude is saying? We're going to issue a battle cry. You and I are going to issue a battle cry. That's what we're going to do this morning. You know, a theologian, I don't know his name, so don't ask me. There's a quotation. He says, he was asked, what is a battle cry for him? What, is, what does it look like to be a Christian for him? And this is what his reply was. My life's work is now in blood and battles from my youth and full of blood and battles in my age and I shall never end this life of blood. I will say it again. My life's work is now in blood and battles from my youth. It's full of blood and battles in my age and I shall never end this life of blood. Do you know what he was really saying there? His life was a battlefield for the Lord. Because spiritually, he had to fight battles right from a young age growing up. How many of you know that you are fighting spiritual battles every single day? Every single day. 
Every single day you wake up, there's a, there's a battle cry that you need to let out and say, today I'm going to war against anyone who comes against me and my God. I'm talking about spiritual battles that you fight. You know, your life must be a crusade for the cross, for the gospel, and for Christ and what he's done for you. That's what our lives should be, church. We need to be true to the word of God and true to the gospel. Let children, young people, don't sit back and let the enemy have a field day. You are young, but you still are in a spiritual warfare battle right now. I spoke to someone the other day, and I asked them how they went because they were delivering a message at one of the local schools. And the person said to me, Auntie Maria, I really wanted to go in and talk about high spiritual battles, but then I realized the group that I was talking to, so I had to tone it down to meet their needs. That's why God says to you and me, at all times, be ready for battle. Do you know? Do you know that the enemy is so stupid that he does the same thing again and again and again and again? And we fall again and again and again and again into his hands. He is so predictable. That's why I say to you today, when I say declare, you declare because he doesn't know what you're going to say until you declare it from your mouth. And when you declare it from your mouth, you're telling him where to go. Are you with me, church? There is a thought that comes through as, as when you read through Jude. And the thought is that he's actually speaking to a knowledgeable crowd of people at that time. And they were known as the Gnostics in the church. They were people full of knowledge. They believed that they were so super, so super knowledgeable that they knew everything that they needed to know. And Gnostics believed in a term called antinomianism. Nomi means law. So that's why Deuteronomy means law. Yes? Yeah? Antinomianism means anti-lawism. In other words, you know your, your, your free grace, your hyper grace kind of movement? This is the words that they say. We are people of the grace of God. So that's good. Yeah, you and I are of the grace of God. Yep. We have the grace of God. Yes, perfect. We have been set free. Yes, we have. But this is where it's different. These people say, Therefore, and these were in the church. That's why Jude is actually writing this. Therefore, we don't need to obey any laws at all. We can do whatever we like and go wherever we like. That's why we need to be careful about the type of grace that God gives us and what the type of grace certain worldly people actually say we have. Anti, anti nominism is all around us today. And Jude says, that's why Jude says in verse 4, they turned. Can we put up verse 4, please? And I want you to read this church because this is what's happening in the church today. We, we say we are born again. We say we know the grace of God. But this is what is happening. This is what Jude is saying. They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness because you know what they said? We are saved. God wiped my slate clean. Now I can do what I want and as I please. And yet God's word says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Every day you ought to confess your sins. Do you know when Pastor Bob Chapman, I only found this out yesterday, his wife got up to share her testimony and um, she said, the day he was going to die, he sat next to her and he said to her, I want to confess everything so that when I meet the Lord, my slate is clean. And he, she said he opened out everything that he had ever done to her and to anybody else. And he was at total, total peace. I don't know if you knew that, Mike. But he was our lecturer at Bible College as well. These people have a form of godliness, but there's nothing in them. That's what the word of God says. And verse 4 says, they denied him not only in their words, but in their actions and in their theological viewpoints. They had an arrogant attitude. And Jude is saying to us, when you have those people come into your church, or when you come across those people who carry that prideful spirit, you've got to be careful and you've got to deal with it. 
You know, there's a book called Your God is Too Small. A, Your God is Too Small, written by J.B. Phillips. Many people actually believe that God is too small. But I but want to say to you this morning, while I cannot grasp the breadth and the, and the multitude and the mightiness of our God, my God is not too small. My God is big. He is supernaturally big. We cannot grasp what God, that God can do things that he did in the Old Testament, he, he can do in the New Testament, and what he did in the New Testament, he can do for you and me today. Amen? Amen. You know what saddens me the most, church? That even today, we find it absolutely impossible to believe that God is so big that he can do it again. Sad. Today, I want you to walk away believing that the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, who did it then, will do it again for you. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I just gave you an introduction into Jude. I want you to go home today and prepare your heart. Read the next few verses. And we're going to go scripture by scripture. We're going to look at how vigilant and alert you ought to be as the church of God. Can you open your heart up to Jesus this morning? Church, just where you are sitting down and just, just, just allow God to come and, and minister to you. You know, perhaps the world has got into your thinking and God has prompted you this morning to repent. Perhaps the Bible has never been opened. It just sits somewhere. And on a Sunday morning, if it's too heavy to carry to church, your, your mobile phone will be sufficient. I'm actually going to ban mobile phones from church. Get a basket and dump every mobile phone as you enter in. Perhaps it's so heavy to carry the word of God and open the word of God and, and get a pencil and get a pen and, uh, and underline and write. God, what are you speaking to me today? Is that you? Can I urge you, church, go and get your Bibles out from wherever they are kept. Make a commitment today to know the God of the Bible, to know who he is. Perhaps you've been going to A and B and C and D and trying to get advice, and, but you're still left in the same spot. Jude's telling us today that our God is not small. He's big. Don't rationalize God. And if you've doubted his power today, can I ask you to Come before him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I just want to come back and I, I just want to open, open the eyes of my understanding that I might know how big and powerful you are. I may not get, fathom everything about you. Perhaps you've lived in doubt constantly. Do I? Don't I? Maybe you're at a decision-making point. Can I ask you to go to the scripture? Go to God? Perhaps, church, there is a tolerant spirit. And I speak to that tolerant spirit in the church today to say, the Lord rebuke thee, tolerant spirit. The Lord rebuke thee. 
Because if there is even a little bit of something that is not of God and we have, we have tolerated it, it will be established. And today I'm saying to every one of us, even to myself, if there is something that I've tolerated, say no more. No more. By the power of the Holy Spirit in me, I say no more. We serve an awesome and a powerful God. And as we delve into the book of Jude, we're just going to glean gems that's going to equip us in the days to come. And God is saying to us this morning, beware, be alert. And in all these things, I will still be with you. I, will, I have never forsaken you as a church. But beware that there are wolves in sheep's clothing. They will come in to devour. And today, Father God, I pray for a deep spirit of unity, a spirit of love, of peace. Father, I pray for a spirit of peace. I pray, Father, that there will be mercy found in this house today. For every person that cries out and puts their hand up or lifts their eyes unto you, that there will be mercy found in the house of God today. We receive this mercy this morning, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood shed on the cross for us. Church, the Lord is equipping every one of you to be strong and to be vibrant, to be a light unto this world. Be a light for Jesus. Make a commitment. I'll give you another minute or so. Make a commitment in your heart and say, Lord, I want to be this beacon that shines for Jesus. Not hidden under a bush. Not hidden and put under a rock. But I want to stand up a light for Jesus. Can you, can you say that can you just in your personal time? Lord, I want to be your light. I want to be your light. We worship you, Jesus. I'm just going to ask Pastor Keith and the team to, to just minister in song. And then I'll come back and, and we'll close in prayer. And we are more than happy to pray that our pastors here will pray for you. Don't forget too that we've got a beautiful celebration after this for all our young mums. And I want to leave this word with you, church. Be equipped. Be strong in the Lord. The Lord is on your side. Praise the Lord.